No, which yeah, slide? It's in, it's in. It is in the fifth slide now. Fifth slide. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Now it's okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's working. Okay. 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 That's the second slide. It's okay. the second slide. Yeah. All right. Now the third slide is the inter interaction Fine. between the two. The, the fourth slide is where people try to do general relativity using the framework of quantum mechanics. Can you see this slide with Feynman diagrams in the picture? Yes, yes. Okay, let's see this, hope this works then. Now, I'm not, don't bother to read at the bottom. I just wanted to say that it's, it's hard. To, okay, there's a lot of work done on this kind of procedure, but it's really hard to talk about black holes and things like that. And you get divergences and all sorts of problems. Um, anyway, it is a way, it clearly it's a, a procedure for trying to combine the two. Now one can also think of trying to do, no, this hasn't, oh yes, here we are. Aspects of quantum mechanics in general relativity, that is to say quantum field theory in curved backgrounds. This is only a partial theory because the, you don't get the back reaction of the background on the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, what's going on in the quantum mechanics doesn't reflect back on the background. However, the most successful aspect of this kind of approach was Stephen Hawking's analysis of black holes and why they have a temperature and an entropy and that they will eventually radiate. So I want to move to the next picture. And I may have to slide my pictures up. Yes, this is a picture of a evaporating black hole. There's a bit of an irony here because in order for the horizon to shrink, my time is going up the picture. So we imagine that uh, time is moving from the bottom to the top and the evaporation, since the horizon gets smaller, you have a violation of the positivity of the energy flux, which was a key thing in the proof that I had for the singularities in black holes. I don't know whether people have tried to remove the singularities by removing that condition because you, it's, it's a very small effect here, but you have to have a, the, the um, when you bring quantum mechanics into it, you can have a negative energy flux. And this allows the horizon size to shrink. And we have the evaporation and the thing disappearing in the remote future. Let me move onwards. I'll come back to the uh, evaporating black hole later. Um, any complete com combination between the two will be a radical change in both theories. I'm not really going to talk about these. There are various theories such as loops and strings and things like that. None of them really give any indication of an experimental test. And so they're a long way from being testable physics at the moment. Um, now I want to, not to talk about that so much. What I do want to talk about, my next picture, I have an angle on the combination of these theories, which is to address the problems in both theories. On the right hand side, right at the top of the picture, we have a picture of singularities, and we will come to that in a minute, whether quantum mechanics can actually address the singularity problem. And on the right, on the left hand side, we have the Schrodinger's cat. So you have a, a cat which is half dead and half alive. That's a cartoon sort of indicating that. And I regard that as a central problem of quantum mechanics. Of course, there are other problems. When you, when you have divergences in, in all sorts of things in quantum field theory in various places, maybe general relativity would help out the divergences. But the question of the collapse of the wave function, which I come back to later in the talk. But for the moment, let me talk about the singularities in general relativity. And um, the next slide, I want to address the question, really of the title of the talk, of why it is, I would argue, that quantizing general relativity in any sensible kind of quantum theory is, if it's going to solve the singularity problem, we would have to be grossly time asymmetric, which is not like any quantum field theory I know. For a long time, I believe that as, as the only solution, but let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is that we have, well, I had my singularity theorem for black holes, and Stephen Hawking very pick, 
quickly picked up on the techniques and tried to apply them to the singularity of cosmology, namely the Big Bang. And one can obtain theorems of similar character, which show that in general situations, you still get singularities, as long as you have uh, energy conditions on the, on the curvature and so on. But uh, in fact, in, in the universe we know, it's extremely different. Because what we have in the black hole singularities, something where the vial curvature, the conformal curvature, diverges to infinity. So this is what we expect. If you have the complicated perturbations, which may lead you to something like the uh, Lifshitz, um, Belinsky, Kalatnikov, the, the um, modification of their theory they had later on when they did realize that the singularities were generic, you always have a very horrible divergence in the vial curvature, nothing like what we see in the Big Bang, where the vial curvature seems to be zero or very close to zero from the very extreme uniformity we have. So I, it's very hard to see how any theory, which is a normal kind of quantization, would give you something which is so completely different in the future and in the past. This is the point I really want to make that it is extremely different. And I want to discuss this a little bit more. So let's go to the next slide here. And I want to give a picture of what we think of as the universe as being like. For the moment, we have the Big Bang at the bottom, time going up the picture, and the universe beginning to expand, and then the exponential expansion, which we see, which seems to be like a, the presence of a cosmological, positive cosmological constant in Einstein's equations. People call it dark energy because they don't want to prejudice the issue. I think it's a straightforward cosmological constant. At the back of this picture, you will see there's sort of frilly things going on. I just don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is spatially closed or not. It's easier to draw, draw the pictures as though it was spatially closed. And so I pretend it's sort of more or less spatially closed, but it's not really, maybe, and it maybe goes on forever at the back. I'm not really concerned with that issue right now. Anyway, what about? The, big, the early universe, in standard cosmology, it's considered that there is an inflationary phase, and I need a powerful microscope to see the inflationary phase. And um, What we see is something which looks awfully like the exponential expansion we have in the remote future. This is a key point which I'll come back to. I don't actually believe in inflation. I think it's a very artificial theory, and I want to give you one reason why I don't believe in it. One of the ideas that people had about inflation was that it would smooth out the universe so all sorts of irregularities would get stretched out and it would get very smooth. I want to argue that this is completely wrong. There are other things that inflation does, which is probably mainly what kept it alive, is that you need an explanation for the scale invariance in the microwave background. Some of these issues I come back to, but I don't think I'll have time to talk about much of them. Um, but I do want to say that, in my view, inflation does not solve the problem of smoothing out the universe. For the reason, what about time reversing the whole thing? And a time reverse picture, and that's time still going up the picture, even despite the green arrow, I just turned, turned my slide upside down. This is a collapsing universe, and let's suppose it had generic perturbations in it. These perturbations would produce black holes and all sorts of a mess, and you would get something much more like that with a horrible, uh, complicated situation, maybe like the Misner, Belinsky, Kalatnikov, uh, Lifshitz situation, where you have very, very complicated situation with wildly diverging vial curvature, and nothing like what we seem to be seeing. Let's we'll see if we think if that was generic, then why didn't we have this as generic Big Bang? Inflation does nothing. If you, if you put the inflationary field into your collapsing universe, it doesn't even do anything at all. So it doesn't really explain why you, it only does it when you start off pretty close to uniformity anyway. So it doesn't solve the problem is the main point I want to make. Now, that this is the universe that we see, not the one we just have. The issue is very much connected with the second law of thermodynamics. Now here I have a cartoon of a gas in a box at the top three pictures. Time is going from left to right now. The top three pictures, we imagine a, a box 
a little box in the big box and we open up the little box and the gas begins to spread out and you get more and more uniformity. So the second law tends to give you that kind of picture. Whereas if you imagine a lot of stars in a galactic scale box, and if they were starting off uniform, they would start to clump and get more clumped. And in fact, the picture looks very different. It looks almost like the opposite of the other picture. And you get entropy increasing until you get black holes, which would completely dominate the entropy in the universe. <clears throat> So what we seem to have in our universe, you see the, the fact that we see the microwave background is very uniform and we also see the spectrum, which is very close to maximum entropy. And then as far as the matter is concerned, we do get very much like the top picture. But as far as gravity is concerned, we get very much like the bottom picture where the entropy is very low at the beginning and not at the end. So what we're seeing is the top right and bottom left which is a very strange picture. It means that in the Big Bang, gravity was very, very strangely not thermalized and everything was thermalized. So you want a theory which does that for you. And here, we're, let's go back to the cosmological picture of the universe. And instead of trying to apply quantum gravity, which I don't see how it's going to give you this extraordinary difference and explain why the Big Bang was like that, I want to have a different angle on the Big Bang. And this different angle, I want to talk about conformal geometry. Now, one reason for doing this is, is it's been very useful in studying infinity to talk about gravitational radiation. It was very important for me to be able to squash down infinity. And I have here this Escher picture, which is very useful to think about what infinity looks like when you squash it down. <clears throat> and here we have uh, the hyperbolic plane. Don't worry about the hyperbolic geometry. But what I'm trying to say that its infinity is now represented by this conformal squashing by a completely smooth boundary. It's very nice, this early Escher picture, because you can see these fish have circular eyes and it, should, it illustrates the conformal structure because they remain circles right, right down to the very edge. Now, it's a very useful trick to talk about infinity in this way by squashing it down. But I'm going to extend this trick using an idea partly due to my former graduate student, Paul Todd. And we can apply the trick not only to infinity to squash it down, but to the Big Bang and stretch it out. I should say that when you have a cosmological constant, infinity becomes space-like, so it's roughly like being a time. <clears throat> so it's the time infinity, which is the squashed remote future. And there you can do this under very, very general circumstances. <clears throat> the stretching out of the Big Bang is a huge constraint. So they're very different. To say that you can squash down infinity is something which <coughs> you almost get automatically, but to stretch out the Big Bang requires a huge constraint. But the idea is that it is the sort of strength constraint we see. Another feature of this is with the remote future is dominated mainly by massless things, let's say photons. There are uh, hydrogen and various things running around too, but I'm going to, for the moment, just consider the massless photons. I have to make a hypothesis in the scheme, which I'm going to describe, in that the mass does, remote, does fade out in the remote future. Um, I don't particularly want to discuss this here, but that is the, the, the main hypothesis that one wants to make here. But if everything is massless, for, for instance, Maxwell's equations don't know the difference between big and small. And this has nothing to do with a uniform expansion or contraction. You can stretch, contract and expand in different places by a conformal factor. And Maxwell's equations in the free space don't notice the difference. The Big Bang, what about that? Well, there you have, well, the remote future, you have a uh, very rarefied and very cold. And when you squash it down, it makes it hotter and more dense. What about the Big Bang, where it's very hot and dense, when you stretch it out, it makes it colder and rarefied. You also have the fact that in the neighborhood of the Big Bang, your particles are moving around so fast that their energy is almost entirely in their motion and not in the mass. So they behave effectively as though they're massless particles. So that's one of the reasons why not just the geometry can be done this, it's reasonable for the physics as well. And I want it to be reasonable for the physics because of the next slide, 
where I consider this is the picture of conformal cyclic cosmology, where I say that the stretched out Big Bang is not just smooth. This is the hypothesis that my graduate student at that time, Paul Todd, who became a professor and then retired like all my other graduate students pretty well. I consider I've reached an old age when all my graduate students have retired, which is more or less what's happened. Anyway, uh, Paul's idea was to extend, the, make the hypothesis that this Big Bang has to have, it's just a hypothesis that you could extend it into something before, doesn't have to be a realistic picture, I'm considering it to be a realistic picture, and that's a stronger condition. It does make the vial curvature be actually zero in the, in the, if you look at the equations, it shows you the vial curvature has to be zero and the crossover from one eon to the next. And so that if this picture is to make sense, then you have to have, not by quantum gravity, but by this conformal aspect of things. Okay, so that is the picture I have, and it's, is it just a hypothesis or is it something that we actually have evidence for? Well, you see, for a long time, I thought that you could have, I could talk about this forever and nobody ever, would ever prove me wrong. But then I thought, well, it is possible that you get signals coming across from one side to the other. And the first thing I thought of about this, see in this picture, I'm imagining that we have the red part is our eon I'm calling it each one of these different things, eons. So this is our eon. And then the next picture will show you ours as, this is the previous eon and that's the eon after ours. I use the term eon, I like to spell it A-E-O-N. And the whole universe is this continuing eon after eon where they match conformally one to the next. So that's the idea. Now, what about this picture here? Well, now I have the red one is our eon, and that's us at the top. Uh, the previous eon I have in purple. The crossover is this red horizontal plane there. You have to imagine that's really three dimensional. And what you're seeing here is black holes in the previous eon colliding with one another. And when they collide, they emit gravitational wave signals. And these gravitational waves are massless. And so they do in fact get through. You have to look at the equations to see the effect of what happens when they get through. But there is a signal which would get through. So the initial Big Bang would not be completely uniform. You would have effects disturbances due to the black holes. Now, initially, David Spergel and, and uh, Amir Hadjian tried to look for these things. But the way they were looking for, for them, there wasn't a chance of seeing the phenomenon which I'm indicating here. And that is that if you have a galactic cluster, which is where you tend to see these collisions between supermassive black holes, you have a galactic cluster. And as that, well, the superclusters will get dispersed by the exponential expansion, but the clusters themselves will tend to remain bound. And therefore they will just sit there for a long, long time. And then black holes will form and they'll swallow each other up, they will bang into each other. And when they run into each other, they will produce signals like this. Now in a single galactic cluster, you will find there will probably be multiple collisions of black holes with each other. And so you would not just see one ring. You see, I don't think you can see at the bottom, my brother rather faint. Oh dear, moved ahead in where I just hadn't, hadn't intended. Um, uh, what you would see is something rather faint and uh, maybe too faint to see, but you might be able to pick up if you see concentric rings. And this is what my colleague, my Armenian colleague Vahe Gurzajan did. He looked for concentric rings of low variance. His criterion for this would be slightly lower variance in the temperature around the ring. And you would see concentric ones. Could you see concentric ones? And so uh, he mapped these out. And I want to show you a picture of what he saw. This is from the Planck data. He originally looked at the WMAC data. And this is from the Planck data. And these points you see are the centers of triples of low variance rings. Now they're singled out for the variance being low, not for the temperature. And I would emphasize that because what we see is very remarkable. It's not a uniform distribution over the sky. Now you see, maybe the explanation for what he sees is not uh, an evidence for the conformal cyclic model. 
But if it isn't, we have to have an explanation for this, for this extreme departure from uniformity, which is what one sees. Not just uniformity in the distribution, but uniformity in the temperature. Because the red ones, well, they're the red ones which are actually the, uh, the uh, higher temperature, or that's wrong way around, if you like, because you think they would be blue shifted. So the blue shifted ones are red, if you like, and the red shifted ones are blue. But the red ones, by the geometry of things, it's actually the more distant ones because they, what you're seeing is the radiation coming towards you. You just have to look at the geometry when the, the light cones intersect, as in my previous picture here. It's when you're looking at the distant ones that you will see the signal coming towards you like this. When it's relatively close, you will see the signal going away from you. So it's the opposite way around from what you might expect. Nevertheless, what we see is this very clumping of red signals. In other words, in the model that I'm producing, they are local, clumped together in distance. These are outside our, our, our particle horizon. Our particle horizon would be where our past light cone hits the crossover. And that's as far as we can see in normal cosmology. But this is a signal here, which is actually further out. You can see further out because you can see into our past eon, and that's all right. Anyway, so these are in the picture, the, in the theory, these are more distant. The blue ones up here are closer. They're, they are actually red shifted, but they are closer than the blue shifted ones down here. You have to get used to the color coding being the wrong way around and all that, but never mind. Red ones are actually distant in the theory, blue ones not. The greenish ones down here are probably just about on our past our horizon, so you get a mixture of colors because there are some on one side and some are on the other side. Anyway, that's the picture. Um, and if it's something else you're seeing here, you have to explain the extreme uh, dis discrepancy from uniform distribution. Let me move on to the next picture. What about the Hawking evaporations? For a long time, I didn't want to talk about that because this is one thing which is not a smooth continuation across. You see, in the in the pictures I'm having, I like to imagine that the crossover from one eon to the next can be treated by equations. And you can produce nice equations which tell you how I evolve from one side to the other. And uh, it, it doesn't involve many assumptions. You can have a, a nice evolution which goes across from one side to the other. But you have to have only, only massless fields at the limit in the future and in the minute limit in the past. In the past, that's a reasonable assumption, and it's a, a, a presumption which is made in the theory that the mass fades out in the remote future in order for this to work. But you can see you can have equations which govern what goes across. But what I didn't like the idea was what happens to the ev Hawking evaporation. Now, you see, the Hawking evaporation um, may take an awful long time. Here I say it could be a Google years, 10 to the 100 years. According to a calculation of Don Page, you may well have to wait 110 to the power 103 years before the Hawking evaporation really takes over and the black hole disappears. Now, <clears throat> the issue arises whether the entropy in the black hole goes all into the radiation. Does it go into the pop at the end where the uh, <clears throat> singularity, in my view, destroys information? I was hearing the discussion a little earlier where people were rejecting that view. I think information is destroyed in the singularity. Probably a lot comes out also. It doesn't much matter in what, is, what I want to say here, which is curious fact. Um, but what I want to show you now is a car, uh, the picture that we have in a paper that I wrote with three colleagues, Christoph Meisner, Pavel Nirovsky, two Poles, and uh, Daniel Ann, who did the computer analysis, uh, he is a Korean who now works in New York. And so we, it's fairly uh, uh, international, our paper. Um, and this, card, this, uh, in, this diagram shows you, it's a space time diagram, roughly speaking, time going up. The bottom horizontal line is the crossover from the previous eon to ours, according to our scheme. And here we have the world line of a supermassive black hole. Almost its entire radiation, even this uh, after, well, after, 
because it's 10 to the 100 years maybe, this would be completely squashed up right up against the crossover surface. And so all that radiation, whether it, the information is in the radiation or whether it's in the, destroyed in the in singularity, it doesn't make much difference because it's all concentrated in that one point there. And when you cross over onto the other side, this is much, much smaller than the Planck scale. So you have to think of this as virtually one point which carries the entire information right through into the, or it, whether it carries the information or not is an interesting question. I wouldn't think it does not because you know, the physics over here is, is certainly way, I mean, whatever the physics is at that point, certainly is where you would expect quantum gravity to have a relevance. I argue that quantum gravity has no relevance in the main part of the crossover. So the, the discussion of the Big Bang almost everywhere else is nothing to do with quantum gravity. It has to do with the conformal description of what's going on. Okay, that's a little bit of a departure from standard physics, but not much of a departure, and you, saw, you treat it with classical equations. However, at the Hawking point itself, I call this a Hawking point, where the, the world line of the Hawking evaporating black hole encounters the crossover, and then we have, a, you, what happens to the entropy is a separate question, but you know that the mass must be there from integrals that you can perform around the point there. So you, you certainly have to have the mass coming through. And that means that you have an effect which comes through and the next horizontal line is decoupling or, or uh, whatever, it doesn't matter which of the uh, decoupling or, or blast scattering, they're more or less in the same place in the picture. This is 380,000 years from here to here, and you only see it. The light doesn't escape, it just scatters about, and you, you get a sort of Gaussian description here. I've got at the top of the picture the sort of temperature distribution. This is about four degrees across in the sky, eight times the diameter of the moon. So you would see a spot of raised temperature. The temperature is raised by about a, an order of magnitude and a half, something like 30 times the normal temperature variations, and we see these signals. When I say we see them, they are seen in the Planck data with using the analysis that Christoph Meisner introduced. Nobody has complained about that analysis as far as I can see. It's perfectly good analysis. The indication is that these signals are there with a confidence level of 99.98% confidence. This doesn't, you can also pinpoint some of them, the actual location, the way the analysis is done, it doesn't tell you where they are. However, Daniel Land did look for significant raisings in temperature. And in the Planck data, if you look for the five strongest points, and then you look in the WMAP data, you find those five points exactly in the same places that you see Hawking points in both data. So I think that's a very strong indication. There's another one in the, in, in the WMAP data, which if you, is just about as strong, and you look back in the Planck data and you see it's there too. So the six strongest points, which I'm calling them, are clearly in both fields, and I think they are probably Hawking points. And there are, there are other interesting features about these points, which I could discuss if people want to raise the questions about them. I did want to say a little bit more about uh, the other end of the subject. This, uh, this is now going back to my uh, picture here. I will only just touch on this. Um, here I talked about singularities. What about the other side of things? How does quantum gravity or whatever it is get affected by general relativity? And I think this is a serious question that people don't discuss much. The point I want to make is that the principle of equivalence, here I have it illustrated with Galileo, where he probably didn't actually drop from two rocks from a leaning tower, but he talked about it. And an insect on one rock would see the other rock as though there were no gravity. And here we have space traveler seeing the same thing. And here I have the argument which I put forward some years ago to show a contradiction between the principle of equivalence and the principle of superposition and quantum mechanics. Here I imagine a tabletop experiment, and we have uh, just a tabletop experiment where you want to take into consideration the Earth's gravitational field. 
There are two ways you might do it. One way using the green coordinates is the Newtonian way, where you put a term in the Hamiltonian. That's the ordinary way you put the Earth's field in for the gravitational potential. The other way is the Einsteinian way, where you consider a freely falling frame. And in the freely falling frame, you get a different answer. That's the purple coordinates. But they differ rather remarkably. You have no, no term in the Hamiltonian now. But rather remarkably, it is only a phase factor between the two. So you might say, who cares? But then you look at the phase factor and you see it's got a T cubed rather irritatingly in the phase factor. So it's not, it's not a harmless phase factor. It tells you that the two descriptions are in di different vacua, the different quantum field theory. Again, you might say, who cares? You stick to your quantum field theory and you'll get a consistent answer. OK. Who cares there? But let's change the situation slightly. In the experiment, I have a, a body which is put into a superposition of two locations at the same time. And then you imagine how the discrepancy as you move around in the neighborhood of the superposition, you get trouble because you have, if you use the Einsteinian perspective, which I argue is the correct perspective, because that's, after all, that's what general theory is, relativity is based upon, Newtonian is just approximation. You take the Einsteinian perspective, then you have to change your vacuum as you go around, and that's inconsistent. What do you do? Well, this model you have to give up at this point, but you can't do it. But what I say is, well, try and do it anyway, and you try to estimate the error in doing it. And then you integrate that error over, and you get what I call the, well, what some people call the, uh, um, actually, I have to move my picture up. The uh, well, this, this, these are pictures just showing you how the accelerations are inconsistent when they're in superposition, and you have to have a scheme which makes sense of that. And when you, you say it's an error, and I say this error is an energy error, and you can work it out, and you can see it is the gravitational self energy of the difference between the two mass distributions. And I call this EG, and that is the, I call that, and I use the Heisenberg time energy uncertainty relation to give you a lifetime for this thing. So it decays like an unstable particle with an energy uncertainty, and this gives you a lifetime for that system. This gives you a, 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 a criterion which was discovered previously by Deoshi. So sometimes people call this the Deoshi Penrose model. I don't want to call it that because the models are really different. But the, the, the time for the reduction for a superposition of two masses in different places to become one or the other is the same in our two schemes. So that is that is the scheme which Deoshi originally introduced, and it's the H, H cross over the gravitational self-energy of the difference between the two mass dis distributions. Okay, well, that I think is a good criterion and it's useful to see if experiments can be performed to, to do this. Uh, this is just showing you what happens when you move two bodies. This is a uniform spherical body and you uh, move it away from itself. I'm just indicating that you can also move it separate from itself. It's about two thirds of the gravitational self-energy from superposition to contact and you get another third moving it out. So let's consider that second third. And now I'm considering the space-time picture again. Here I have a body. This body is now put into a superposition of two locations. And then after this lifetime, one of them disappears and the other one persists. But what I'm trying to show in this picture is that it's, con it's inconsistent with special relativity if one of them simply disappears and the other one becomes the whole state. And here I have two possible observer. We have from observer moving, say, from um, right to left. You have the A uh, simultaneity surfaces. And from left to right, it with the B simultaneity surfaces. And for the A one, you see that the um, one of them has become the complete state, while the other one is still there. And the B one, uh, the other one is partial state and the other one has disappeared. And so you have a probability they might just both disappear and the other one they might both appear. So that's obvious nonsense. So this picture doesn't make any sense. So what I'm saying is that really it has to happen right back there at the place where they diverged. And so let me finish by giving you my picture, which is a strange picture. 
this is the picture that I have of what really happens. Here we have a, uh, a laser which emits a single high energy photon, which hits a beam splitter, and this is split into two, and one goes down, and this the other one goes horizontally. The horizontal one is therefore put into a superposition of being moved and not moved. And so if you follow the space time up, you have the space time in the superposition of two different space times. And then it gets more and more uncomfortable. And when it gets to this point where the collapse takes place, one of these disappears. But this is the quantum reality is that one disappears. And I'm saying there's a difference between quantum and classical reality. The classical reality goes right back to where they diverged, and it, it is there is no, it's as though it never happened. You have to follow the classical picture. I should perhaps describe what I mean by these two realities, um, if I can get it here. Classical reality of a system, you can ask the system, what is your state? And the system can say, yes, my state is X. For quantum reality, you can't do that. You can have a good idea what the state might be, and you can say, maybe the state is X. So you ask it, say, is your state X? And you've got it, if you've got it right, it will say, yes, with certainty, my state is X. But if you've got it wrong, it will only give you yes or no. So you have to do it many, many times to check whether you're correct or not. I should say a little bit more about what quantum reality is. This comes from Einstein's dictum, I say, which is if, if in when, any way uh, you can perform an experiment which, with, which doesn't disturb the system and with certainty gives you a certain answer, then that gives you a reality to the state. And that is what I'm calling quantum reality. The quantum reality comes from Einstein's dictum. The classical reality comes from the st structure of space time. And they're not quite the same. I think I've run out of time at this point, so I'll stop if people have questions. And if there's any time for questions, I'm glad to answer them. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Roger, for this uh, <clears throat> inspiring, very inspiring talk. And so now we are uh, open for uh, two or three questions. OK. I, uh, Yeah, I think there's Philip wants to ask. Uh, Philip, yeah, Philip, yes. Uh, I think. Yes, yes, sir. And then Hello. Um, also, yes. Also Gera. yes, okay. So uh, Philip and then Gera. Yes. All right. Um, yes. Yes, I wanted, I wanted to comment, to Roger, on the Colella, Overhauser and Werner effect. I actually did a calculation of sending a classical light ray around their interferometer. And you get a fringe shift because as the light travels <clears throat> across the interferometer, it bends. Yeah, and, that's the, and that gives rise to the fringe shift. So it's already there in the classical theory. And then I did the same thing with the neutron, did the relativistic calculation following um, the geodesics. And I found the same fringe shift. So the, new, the neutron does give you the fringe shift as well. And very interestingly, what I liked about this whole theory was the phase is e to the i times the action. And the action depends on the mass. And that means that the mass becomes observable in the quantum interference, even though it drops out of the classical example of, of the Galileo experiment. Yeah. And when you, when you do that, you find that you can have an experiment with no gravity where the phase is an inertial mass and the phase in the gravity case, the phase is the gravitational mass and they are equal. And that's, that was the result that I uh, announced. So I think that the quantum mechanics is compatible with the equivalence principle. Uh, but you've not got any gravity here. So I'm not sure I understand. Uh, in, 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 sorry, in an external gravitational field, yes. Oh, it's one of the gravitational field. Yes. So it's a field. Yeah. field. Yes, yes. Well, I wasn't claiming that there was any diff difficulty there. Yes. So I guess okay. you're confirming that. I guess is that right? Yes. In the case uh, we have, because I, as I was saying, you have a, a like, you have a different vacuum, but it's a consistent vacuum. Mm -hmm. It's only yeah. when you have the superposition of two masses that you run into this problem. 
But that's oh, okay. an interesting point you're making. I, I, I find that interesting, yes. Oh, thank you. But in a sense, it's a, it's a test of the, uh, uh, of the fact that you stick to the one vacuum or to the other vacuum, you get the... the Everything goes control. through, yes. Yes, that's right. But you're not testing the superposition principle because it's not... No, uh, that's correct. ...superposition between two gravitational fields, yes. Okay, so maybe now Gerard wants to ask something. Yes. Okay. Yes, Roger, I don't know whether you attended the previous discussion, but uh, my point was there that uh, one should not worry Sorry, about the polarity of the black hole because, because of cosmic censorship. What's wrong with the cosmic censorship if you apply it to an ordinary Schwarzschild black hole where it seems to be perfectly valid also in the other black hole solutions that we know, cosmic censorship works extremely well. Yes. Uh, so the, the singularity is not at the center of a black hole, but it is in the infinite future, as, as you know very well. Uh, as, uh, well it depends uh, what you call few infinite futures. <laughs> it's a finite. It's beyond yeah. the infinite future, as seen for, by the outside world. So what we want is, is physical equations that the outside observer can use to understand what's going on. And that outside observer never sees a singularity. So, the physics equation are just fine for the outside observer. Um, what would you say about the the pop at the end, though? Because that is um, the, the what still, at the end. Yeah. No, uh, oh, the same thing actually. That um, before there's actually ever a singularity taking place at t equals plus infinity, the black hole evaporates. So there's just a, a Planck size object surviving, perhaps or a particle, just a heavy particle that comes out of the explosion. But uh, you should be able to use ordinary quantum mechanics to describe that. Now, we don't know exactly how to do this today, of course, we're so far away from it. But in principle, you can imagine, okay, let the black hole just evaporate more or less classically until it has a Planck size. And then the, la the last pop will be pure Planckian physics that we know quite little about uh, today. Um, and actually my picture then becomes entirely symmetric on the time reversal again. So the formation of a black hole is just exactly the time reverse from the final pop of the black hole, except that uh, probability wise things are different. So the, since entropy has- symmetrical, the light cones are very different the other way around. Well, you can make them look very, very much alike. Sorry? You can make them look very much alike, also the light cones. But for right. that, to, to understand that, as the picture I, I just briefly mentioned there, uh, let's consider the Penrose diagram for the eternal black hole. That's the diagram in which you, you mean, can... Can you tell me what you mean by an eternal black hole? An, an eternal black hole is one that, that existed for much, much more time than you are interested in describing. Yeah, want to describe its evolution over a short time moment in time, a few seconds or so. During a few seconds, the eternal diagram is just fine. And I have, I have a way of, of, of mapping. I'm sorry, I still don't understand. What, data inside. What is and, the conformal uh, diagram of an eternal black hole? Can you tell me? Uh, the diagram for the eternal black hole, one oh. moment, or oh, I erased it now. Um, well, I can't see. I've obviously. I, I, you have to describe well, it. I can't. Well, I can try to put it on my screen. Um, I, I see, but I'm not sure I can see. Um, oh, I think just maybe I can see it. One, 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 minute, one minute. I have to magnify it up a lot, otherwise I won't see anything. Yes. Can you see it now? Oh, you mean it's a, it's the whole the full cross skull picture? The full cross skull picture, yes. And uh, what you yeah. see here is uh, the. Uh, can you see the picture now? It's. Yes, it's no, the, I can the region, region one and region two. But and there's a, a whole universe which somehow has appeared from nowhere. Is that right? Uh, it's a black hole, which this is the black hole which existed for eternity. Uh, so it has been. Are, are you identifying the internal and the outside or something? I, I haven't got the picture. Right. This, this, is, this is region one, this is yeah. the outside. But that's also the outside, but the other hemisphere. So my favorite picture is that this 
is the other hemisphere compared to that. And then they, they are glued, the two hemispheres are glued. Together. Let me just get you, I want to get the reality of this picture straight. Is the left hand, the right hand picture is supposed to be the universe we know about. Yes. Is the left hand picture another universe which is sitting out it's there It's the same, the same universe of the same black hole, but at so the other. Identifying. So are you identifying? Yeah, you go to the antipodes. Then you have a singularity in the middle. No. Just you because have, of that, there's no singularity in the middle. This is an S2 sphere. And, no, no. and the S2 sphere becomes a projective sphere. That way, you can have the antipodes of his it being mapped onto the antipodes there. there. And there's no singularity at the origin. It's a single, it's not maybe a curvature singularity, but it's a singularity of, of uh, the geometry doesn't work. I it mean, it does work amazingly well, it works. <laughs> no, but, but as you said, it's identified, it's not a two sphere. The whole thing is, you need it's the entire quotient surface. You can't stop here. It's a projective plane, is it? Yeah, the, at this point in the center, it's a projective, projective S2 sphere. Yes, but that's, that makes that's not a, the, the geometry doesn't make a smooth picture. It, it, it has, it's fine. It has a. a locally, it's different from our space time. It seems to be different from our space time. But locally. It's not about an unsingular space time. I'm sorry. sorry. You have a whole sphere in the middle. No, no, no. no. At the outside world is completely regular. If it's a projective plane in the middle, then you've identified in a way which, which isn't consistent. You think so, but you, you, you might think again and discover that you can make this entirely consistent. The, the only thing is, is the, 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 the two points, two special points. One is how did the black hole form and how did the black hole decay, but only the first microseconds of its formation and the last microsecond of its decay which are at Planckian domains of physics where we know very little. So I'm not particularly- It's not the way a black hole forms. The, the black hole would not form like this because you have it matter. Is. No, the, you don't see the matter, but that's the whole point. I removed the matter, which means that from now on, if I, continue, if I continue to the infinite past, I'm not entering into the, the past of, of the universe. I'm entering into a completely forbidden region of the black hole. But here, but is, this bottom, the is this world. bottom triangle full of matter or is it empty or where, no. what is that? Ah, that's a very good question, excellent question, because um, what's called vacuum here is a completely filled space here. So this observer sees that other hemisphere of the universe. However, it's got energy inverted and time inverted so that the, he sees empty space here, but from here on when he looks through this point, you will see a completely full universe, which but again is it sounds there's a lot of things that don't way. make sense to me in your picture. This right? path thing, which the green line, the green joins, line is the path event horizon. What is, it? is there space time there? Is there matter there? Is there vacuum there? What's doing there? Um, what would this, a being sitting at that point could see? Consider this as a model for a black hole. Well, there's, there's matter getting out here. And I can explain to you what that is. That's actually the, 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 the Hawking radiation is coming out from, the, from this past horizon to us. But it the, moves in this direction and in that direction. That those are the Hawking parts. not a black hole in our own universe because black holes don't form that way. They form from collapsing material. Well, but that's, that you can't see in, in this eternal black hole because it's too long in the, too far in the past. You have two time scales. This is the diagram that, that acts at a short time scale. At a very, very long time scale, you might see the black hole forming. Your only problem is the first, very, the first infinitesimal moment when you have to make a switch between this picture and the picture of a black hole where you do see matter going in. But what's left over of the matter going in? Like your picture with the matter drawn in. So, so yeah. sorry, guys. Maybe can can we? Because still we have yes. one question from Alexei. The picture is too complicated. I've written it all down. You can read it. But it turns out that that you you have to make this answers and you can verify everything a posteriori. It works. But it's and not. I can not show like you many times I had it completely wrong. Uh, but no, it's not like the real world. Can we postpone uh, the discussion to the? Of course, because That's fine. we will have more than one hour in uh, at the end to this to continue okay. the, the, the discussion. Maybe we have time to come back to it. Yes. And and uh, I I still have a question from Alexei. 
Alexei want to ask something. Yeah. Starobinsky. Okay. okay. Uh, the, uh, the, in, in Roger, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, very inspire, inspiring talk. I have a question regarding your um, conformal uh, di diagram, this um, long uh, vertical a tube. Uh, uh, I think in this case, if if you have uh, uh, your conformal diagram in the form of a, a vertical, uh, long vertical tube, uh, you should have Cauchy -Hat, you you should have Cauchy -Hat risings, and as you investigated in seventy eight, and I with Igor Novikov investigated in 79, uh, uh, the horizons should be unstable. Oh, Cauchy horizons, yes, yes. Uh, I don't see why they're un... Oh, oh, I see. If you have a Cauchy horizon, yes, yes. Sorry, I have to remember these things from back, way back. Yes. I guess that's, oh, that's no. likelihood. Yes, yes, they could be unstable. Yes, yes. It was your uh, 78 paper. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember. But that's right. This was an argument in favor of cosmic censorship. Is that right? Once more, uh, my statement when, in, in case you have your conformal diagram of the um, uh, uh, cyclic universe, uh, then you should have. Oh. You yes. should have. But this, of course, the, the cyclic universe I'm talking about now is very different. I mean, a cyclic universe in which you you had a, uh, um, say, a collapsing universe or something like that. I'm not sure which. I mean, this is certainly very different from other cyclic universe models, where one has to have the the conformal um, geometry is. Uh, the conformal infinity matches to the conformally stretched Big Bang, rather than having a a, uh, a crossover which which is, a, is of a more local kind. I'm not sure the picture you're talking about here, but yes, I, I think you ha you tend to have trouble, like, such as in the uh, the Taub nut space. There you have that situation. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking about? You have something which superficially looks a bit like my picture. Where you have a uh, the Taub universe going into the Nut universe, and there you do have a, a Cauchy horizon, mm -hmm. which is likely to be unstable because any in perturbations in the in the light rays as they go round and round and round and meeting themselves, and that would build up and form an instability. So perhaps that's the situation you're referring to. It looks superficially like the the pictures I was having here, but in fact very different. Yes, 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 yes. Roger, yes. It's it's just what what happened in the case of the, of a collapse of electrically charged uh, black holes, which expands in to the uh, future universe. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I think I get your picture. Yes. Yes. But that is a different model from what I'm saying here. Yeah. Okay, maybe maybe, so you, maybe we, we we can okay. postpone also this discussion. Otherwise. Uh, yes. Okay, let, let's let's uh, thank Roger again, and uh, uh, and.